G'day, I'm Irma Ranieri, Commissioner for Public Sector Employment. I'd like to acknowledge this land that we meet on today is a traditional land of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. I'd also like to welcome the public sector, including IPA's professional members and acknowledge IPA's major partners, the State Government of South Australia's Senior Management Council, PwC and Flinders University. Welcome also to uh, Dr John Braley and Mr Luke Broomhall for today's session on what's been called the shadow pandemic, the mental health crisis. Hopefully this discussion will be an opportunity for us all to do a stock take of our own mental health, as well as consider the impact of this crisis um, on our state as a whole. And for this discussion, we couldn't be in any more skilled hands. Uh, a brief introduction. Firstly, Dr John Braley. A former South Australian public advocate, Chief Medical Officer for the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, John is now the state's Chief Psychiatrist, a position he's held since May 2018. During this time, he has led the response to the ICAC's o Oakden report, which has included an active program of unannounced inspections of mental health facilities. His office has also worked collaboratively with the Mental Health Commission to develop a government-endorsed mental health services plan for South Australia, which aims to deliver a more innovative, integrated and efficient mental health services across our community. Doctor, um, to Luke Broomhall. I've made you a doctor as well. <laughs> uh, Luke is actually a psychologist and an expert in forensic psychology. Luke is also the Director of Acuity Psychology, which provides employee wellbeing and peer support programs and PsychCheck that undertakes psychological assessment and recruitment suitability screening. With 15 years practical experience in workers' compensation, employee assistance program delivery, critical incident management and uh, personality disorders, Luke has a powerful insight into human behaviour in the workplace. I'm looking forward to this interview. Can I start uh, with the first question to you, John? John, last year your office reported the South Australian community had around 690,000 interactions with our mental health services. That's a high number. Do you have any indication of what the demand has been throughout 2020, given it's quite unique? What is the data telling us? Yes, um, there, there is increased demand that we're seeing at the moment. Um, uh, with, uh, with COVID, um, the, the mental health um, uh, impacts have changed with time. Initially, there was fear of the virus, um, many issues with isolation that still persist to a degree, uh, but the, the economic impacts, people's hope for the future. What, uh, what we're seeing is an increase in people uh, finding our mental health lines. So there's a metropolitan line it's, it's numbers, we look at it each week, uh, they've been consistently up, uh, about 17%. Uh, the, the country line, that's been consistently up in calls as well, 30% has been the figure, but it may actually be going higher at the moment. We're just analysing some data uh, currently. Um, and, and there's also been a 15% increase in presentations to emergency departments for people with mental health and or alcohol and drug problems. So we are seeing the impact with increased demand. Um, this is why it has been important to have a response for the community, for all of the community, uh, and also for uh, at-risk groups. So uh, the last time I was here, we established um, uh, with, um, as part of the COVID response, uh, a range of services, um, a particular COVID line services for uh, called communities, ATSI communities and, um, and carers. Um, uh, that was then expanded to more clinical services um, uh, across age groups, but uh, with focuses on young people, older people, um, vulnerable groups, um, uh, including uh, people in, in prison or, and youth corrections. And, um, and, and currently we're just looking at meeting this, uh, this increased um, crisis demand. So, so that's, that's one measure of the impact on the community and all of us. And, um, uh, and it's, it's one that's clear. It can also be seen in Commonwealth funded services uh, and, and our experience generally with um, 
uh, our clients and our workforce. Great. We'll, we'll explore that a bit further. Um, that's a significant increase. So uh, I'd like to discuss it a little later yes. how we how that might play itself out. Luke, as 2020 draws to a close, it's no exaggeration that we may all be feeling a little exhausted. Sometimes you wonder what you have done, but you do feel quite tired. We've coped with immense with an immense amount of change in the workplace and in our home lives. Um, what can we do to avoid burnout? Um, and, and I think we're starting to feel it, and, and Christmas is coming as well, so we've got to kind of feel jolly at some point as well. So can you give us your take on, on that? Indeed, I think burnout's a good term to use, Emma. Burnout occurs when stressors, uh, which are at a moderate to high level and, and sometimes higher, go on over a prolonged period of time without the ability for people to have a break and, and be able to put those stressors down or, or have relief from those stressors, the longer they go on over time, the more overburdened people become in their coping, in their mental health and wellbeing, and the more likely it is uh, that they might uh, experience burnout. And, and as you've said, coming into the Christmas period as well, we're starting to come into a time of year, I don't know how your diary is looking, but uh, whenever I plan something a couple of weeks ahead now, I, I have to really work to put it in because there's so many things going on, so many demands, uh, both social, family, uh, workplace um, demands, they're all starting to bunch up. So it's, it's a really good time, I think, to have a look at uh, how our strategies are around our own wellbeing. And one of the things I really recommend to people is to take a mental health and wellbeing pulse check. So what that is, is uh, uh, 15 minutes a week where you can sit and plan how you're traveling. So how am I functioning at the moment? Am I, am I under a lot of stress? Uh, am, I, am I losing sleep? Have I been irritable? Am I coping okay? Are, are things actually going all right? Then look, project ahead to the next week and say to yourself, what have I got coming up? And what could I park? Or what could I do? What could I do to fit in aspects of my life that enhance my well-being? So we know exercise. Uh, is, is a big help. Uh, downtime, uh, hobbies and interests, spending time with people, all those things that maintain our resilience and well-being. Are we planning for them? So taking that time at the end of each week or, or at some stage during the week to be able to say, okay, how am I traveling at the moment? Have I been doing things which aren't helping my well-being? So maybe drinking a little bit too much or staying up too late or, or perhaps it's even more simple things like not being assertive enough to be able to say no to something. Um, when you look ahead at your next week and you know it's absolutely packed and somebody comes to you and says, okay, I need this by next week, uh, uh, do we have the ability to be able to say, look, um, I'd love to be able to do that um, and I think I will be able to do it but in the week afterwards rather than in the next week. So we know if we have self-awareness how we're tracking. If we have that self-awareness, we can start to plan around what's appropriate for what's coming. And I think people don't really have that great self-awareness always when they're under pressure. So taking that time to take stock becomes really important and set strategies that are appropriate, not to how you normally function, but how you're functioning right now. Considering uh, COVID restrictions, busyness, time of year, how you're coping, all those aspects. So it's not just a, this is how I usually do things always, it's how I'm doing things now and what's gonna be best for me in the weeks to come. That's great. What we might do is actually send some of those tips out um, as part of this. Uh, so we can remember that. Um, just to follow on from the uh, take a break, often when we take a break, we go away. Um, <laughs> and um, and I think that bit's kind of stumbled us all. So um, I think what I'm hearing you say is take a break could be, um, you know, take a holiday, but the holiday might be that you're at home or just doing nothing. Um, okay. That's a break. Uh, it's, it's in the planning for the break, I think, as well. So it's making time, looking ahead and going, when am I planning for, so we're planning for work, we're planning for tasks and assignments and family and kids and we're planning for all these things. Where's the plan to go to the gym? Where's the plan to spend time in the garden? Where's the time to spend time with someone? Where's the time to uh, go for a walk? And then on top of that, then you, so they're the things you can do immediately. Then we look a little bit further and say, okay, if we're going away, we're not going to Bali anymore. If, if people are going to Bali, but we're, we're holidaying locally. So, okay, let's let's look at where we can get away that's local. And I know local tourism has been driven a lot during this, um, yes. during the pandemic, mm -hmm. so, um, which is good for our state. Mm, less stressful to prepare for it as well. Um, John, South Australians have been in the fortunate position um, of living our new normal for some months now. Is social isolation an issue we still need to be vigilant about? Yes, it certainly is. Um, we're, we're seeing isolation 
in, in different sorts of ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, people are increasingly able to travel interstate, but generally uh, for people with family and friends in other states and certainly internationally, uh, the opportunity to be connected to, to people um, that it, but with in-person visits and holidays um, isn't there. Uh, there are many people um, whose work, their employment is still affected by COVID and, and those people uh, in, in the travel and um, accommodation industries would be an example uh, of that. Not everyone has returned to a workplace and the value of um, meeting with work colleagues, that routine, um, uh, for, for many people it may not be there at all or they may be doing some alternative part-time work and, and the isolation as, as they wonder about their thoughts and future and what's going to happen with the uncertainty, finances, whatever, that, that isolation uh, is, is a factor and, and, um, and, and, and needs strategies to be over, overcome. And then, and then more generally, um, uh, the, the, the pace of our community life is, is returning. Um, many people are working part-time at home, part-time in an office. There, there, is a, there is a new normal, but, um, but, but people are different and we have to, have to respect that. And um, uh, so for all of the advantages of working at home and being uh, connected with family, not having commute times and, and that, that flexibility, um, uh, other people will find the routine of going into the office um, uh, important. I, I suppose for, for a lot of people there's the, there's the mix, uh, but um, uh, working at home can be positive, but it can also be isolating. So they're just some examples where the issues uh, of isolation are still with us, even though we don't have the sort of public uh, health advice um, uh, that we were working to earlier this year. It probably will continue. So I'm proud, I think the public service has proudly uh, worked from home and then returned back. And I yes. think that we are probably one of a lead employer in some of that. You mentioned that there are some employers where they may never come back to an office. So will we actually see, or are you seeing almost a change um, in the way all of, you know, and I think it's yet to, to see how it's playing out, that the way of work is completely changing. Uh, yes, I, I think we, we are seeing it. Obviously, um, uh, the familiarity is more in terms of what's happening in, in, the, in the public uh, service, um, but, but also an awareness um, uh, from the people that, that our um, mental health service system looks after. Um, that uh, that many people still don't know and what what they will be doing next year and um, uh, they might be on job keeper people uh, um, uh, are being laid off uh, from work and then other industries uh, are changing and 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 people then need to have uh, new strategies to look at how they're going to to stay connected face to face with people if um, if they're working remotely for a lot exactly. of the time. Have you seen a lot of that, Luke? Like, have you had people in your um, service that, that are kind of finding that isolation really difficult and no end in sight? I think there's a really broad range of reactions that people are having uh, across the board. Some people are, are really happy to be working from home and, and be a bit isolated uh, for various reasons, either they uh, they aren't having a great time at work or perhaps they're, they're a bit more insular, but other people are really missing it and, and really missing that contact. And I think it is going to change, I agree with John, I think it is going to change uh, how we look at how we undertake work. Uh, Organisations, uh, both government and, and in the private sector, are finding that because they have had to change the way, they've had to change the way they operate, they're finding advantages in that. So that when they come back to normal business, I think a lot of businesses are going to say, well, we've actually found that we can do this a lot more efficiently by making these changes. And those things will uh, have an impact on individuals, those individuals who uh, don't enjoy working from home, uh, who, who are uh, put into a situation in a workplace where they are required to, may find it quite difficult. So we need to make sure we get around those people and make sure their mental health and wellbeing is looked after if those changes occur. Of course, yeah. So, look, until we have a vaccine, we're not sure how long we'll be living with COVID-19. Um, 
and, you know, we don't know where it will meander over the next few years. What's some practical tools and support we can um, embrace to sustain our mental resilience? There's a bit of debate about resilience um, and what that actually means. Uh, so how do we do this over the long haul? We talked about burnout. Um, so now how do you get resilience when you're burning out? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that's a very good question. Resilience is, 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 and is interesting term. It's an interesting topic and I think there's some misunderstanding about resilience and what it really means. So resilience is the ability to bounce back off after adversity is, is technically what it means um, and how a lot of people see it. Um, when you've got ongoing adversity then uh, it becomes more about management um, yeah. than bouncing back. So making sure and, and I think that's where those practical strategies and the first one I mentioned before which applies to burnout also applies to resilience because it's about protecting our well-being is about self-awareness and, and conducting those those check-ins with yourself and, and with your loved ones all the time to see how you're traveling. Because self-awareness is the first aspect of building that resilience. Knowing what the warning signs are for when you're not coping very well and when you might need some assistance. So I think that self-awareness, those pulse checks that we can take on a weekly basis, um, on an ongoing basis, are the things that start to protect us, the strategies that start to protect us from our mental health and wellbeing deteriorating. Beyond that, other practical strategies that we, we start to work with with people are around making sure that, that when we're going through the, these times of uncertainty and there's, there's so much about uh, the weeks and months and, and next year that we don't know about, is trying to create a sense of achievement in just the day-to-day -day aspects of, of our lives. So setting some small goals and achieving them just to give us a sense that things are not that far out of our control that we can actually be, we can have self-efficacy, we can plan events, we can plan tasks, we can plan uh, events that we want to do, and that we can work slowly to achieve those things. They don't need to be massive things. They just need to bring a sense that we have some sort of control over our environment. And it, it helps to reduce anxiety in that way. The other things I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned last time, practical strategies like having a digital detox. So having the ability to be able to, because we're on screens all the time, our phone, we're on Zoom, if we're working from home or, or um, video conferencing, um, we're on the phone all the time, uh, phones and iPads and computers are in our homes, we work from home. There's been that crossover between uh, work and home spaces in terms of uh, working from home during the pandemic. That means it's really, pop, uh, really important to make sure that there's a, a time when we're not in front of our screen. So there's some green time, if you like. I think it, I've heard the term used. So if you're outside and you're walking around but not on a screen, but even if you're at home, that there's perhaps a room where you don't have a phone, computer, tablet, whatever it might be, um, and, and time, a specific time where you have that kind of downtime. Um, Beyond that, I think uh, making sure well-being is is well is, is nice and broad. So it's engaging in those strategies which we know make us resilient and protect our well-being: sleep, diet, exercise, uh, interpersonal relationships, and making time for those those aspects in our lives so that we can maintain our well-being. Okay. Well, on, oh, here we go. on that note, then, John, um, and talking about resilience. Um, one thing, I'll, I'll kind of reflect on my own um, sort of the, this year has been quite challenging for lots of people, but it just appears to be the year where it, there's one thing on top of another. So just when you kind of think, well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll bounce back from this thing, something else happens. Now, I don't know whether we're more attuned to that, but certainly in my own life, there's a lot of little things that have happened that seem to be quite big and getting bigger and just you kind of go, oh, I don't know that I can take one more of those things. But everyone I talk to gives me their story about the other, the extra thing. So um, a comment, I guess, from you in relation to um, is it a year that, that's really different to every other year or are we now kind of um, things are kind of feeling like they're bigger than, than maybe what they were before because we now are, are feeling the, the kind of the, the tired, we're tired from dealing with COVID and all of a sudden things seem bigger than what they might have been in previous years. So, or is it really a bad year? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think you'd have to say that it's uh, it's been a, a year like no, none other in our uh, experience, and um, uh, a once in a hundred year uh, pandemic that um, that followed uh, the bushfires, the um, uh, the concerns about um, um, uh, climate change. There, there are real reasons that that I are feel out better there, now <laughs> um, uh, for for us all to be uh, looking at um, at at this. Uh, 
th this year and, and the impact that, that it's had um, uh, on, on our collective um, uh, mental health. And um, uh, I think um, that, that affects the, the entire community. For, for people uh, who may have already had um, other traumas in their life and, and, and may have worked to, to, to deal with that, uh, that there's a cumulative effect of um, trauma and, and stresses that we, that we need to, to recognise. So what can it, we do? What, what can we do to help ourselves and others in relation to that trauma? Because yes. there's only so much. Well, um, uh, there, there is, but, but uh, as we've been talking today, um, uh, there are strategies that, uh, that, that people can follow in terms of um, um, uh, self-care, being able to, to look after, to have control in the things in their life that, uh, that, that they can. Um, to um, uh, to to balance the uh, the facts, there there have been all of these problems with um, this disaster, but there have actually been uh, uh, some um, some good aspects. The public health response, you know, how how we're sitting in in South Australia and Australia at the moment compared to what we see uh, overseas. Um, so so while it has been. Um, extraordinary and we need to look after ourselves because of that. It's not overwhelming. It, it, it is something that, um, that as individuals and collectively uh, we, we, we can get, um, get through. And interestingly, um, while, we, while we've got to look after ourselves and, and, and acknowledge the, the mental health impact, there have also been some unexpected uh, benefits. Um, People have re-evaluated their lifestyles and, and what's important to them and contact with family. Um, that I, I, I wouldn't want to um, understate the impact of um, quarantine, you know, mandatory quarantine. You know, being in a hotel room for two weeks is a very difficult thing. But even in that environment, uh, you know, we hear of, 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 of people who have... Um, Sort of reevaluated some of the aspects in their life and 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 priorities and 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 that's also come through from um, health professionals who have chosen to to go to Victoria, for example, and then then come back and um, and um, and uh, thought about you know just had that 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 opportunity you know have potentially put themselves at risk but um, have um, uh, had uh, that, that, that opportunity to, um, um, to, to respond to other people's needs in an extraordinary situation and uphold their professional values in that context. I think it probably plays to that greater good and, and purpose yes. that, that we as humans um, really get a lot out of and almost feed our kind of our want, our, our existence to make sure that we're doing things that are sort of purposeful and, right. and I think it does, it, it, that's a really good point and a good, right. good way to look at it. Yes. Um, and, and just picking up John's point that he made before about, um, about how the numbers have increased of people seeking services, part of the idea with self-awareness is to know when we're not coping and to ask for assistance. So it's really important that people understand that there is help which is, which is available in the community um, through community mental health services, um, through counselling services, psychology services. There is help available. Um, there is a stigma there, and there still is a stigma. It's, it's breaking down. Uh, I think it's improving in terms of people understanding what mental health is all about. I still see stigma in the community around mental health being a weakness uh, when people aren't coping. And this is now really being tested. And I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more that people are acknowledging when they're not coping very well and they are reaching out for help. And the, the increased numbers of contact to services would bear that out, I, I would think. I would think so. It can, it's, it can actually be seen as a positive that there is so much awareness and discussion about mental health at the moment. And, and all that, though, that increased demand re reflects more people who are needing, seeking out that care because they, they have symptoms. Um, there will be undoubtedly people uh, who are more likely to get care now than they would have in the past uh, if it wasn't for this uh, collective experience of, um, and knowledge about mental health and the COVID impact. That's great. Um, 
talking a little bit about, I'm going to get some personal counselling here. I know that the quality of my own sleep has actually suffered since the pandemic for whatever reason. I think that in the beginning, the anxiety um, kicks out um, and then, you know, you don't, you know, the unknown and the rest of it. How does sleep deprivation play out at work and, and, and your mental health? Sleep deprivation is sleep is really important. It's it's one of our basic functions, uh, and and sleep deprivation has a, a major impact on on our functioning. Research over the last twenty years has shown that uh, if you go for more than eighteen hours without sleep, you you have a blood alcohol equivalent of 0.05. So that's on the threshold of being able to drive effectively. Beyond twenty four hours, the research is saying that, or, or beyond twenty four hours of no sleep, the research is saying that we're looking at an equivalent blood alcohol level of about 0.1. Okay. So you can imagine if if you're over the limit to drive, uh, that's the kind of um, aspect you're going to be feeling in terms of your, of your functioning. And what that leads to in the workplace are, are issues uh, potentially around memory and concentration, uh, balance and coordination, irritability, um, just being able to undertake those normal role functions that we would do, those aspects really uh, will impact, uh, and depending on what people do, of course, if they're in a manual, manual handling job or, or something that involves some hand-eye coordination, if they have sleep deprivation uh, and their balance and coordination is off, it can increase uh, the risk of workplace hazards. It's a very good tip for leaders to not, you know, if that's actually happening, it's not a not a bad thing to actually talk to people about whether they are getting enough sleep oh, yeah. and whether you can actually help them to maybe restructure the day. Yep. So lots of stuff happens in the morning yep. and then maybe, you know, so so that's actually really, really important. Thank you for that. Um, John, in, uh, in some of our younger members um, uh, of the public sector, um, I think this will probably be the first sort of major kind of global crisis um, is a, 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 on a global scale. What should we keep in mind for these group of people also being mindful that these might be the people that are more socially isolated if they're living alone, um, you know, just trying to work through their career or live, you know, working in hospitality, studying, that sort of stuff. I'm particularly concerned about younger workers. Have you got a, a view on that? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I've um, got a view on um, uh, the impact on, uh, on younger people generally. Um, and then there's the, the, the other part of your question which relates to um, uh, younger members of the, the public service. Um, uh, there has uh, been no doubt that, um, that the pandemic has had a, had a differential Im impact on, on younger people. We, you know, we can see that in our, in our statistics. That increase in, in hospital ED presentations, half of that relates to people under 25. Okay. And, and there is something about uh, being young in that um, age group, looking at the future, the uncertainty, uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, finances. All the, there, there are a range of um, um, uh, elements that have disproportionately affected young people. So we, we have to make sure that, um, that um, all of us are aware, but particularly um, young people, uh, adolescents, young adults, uh, about the impact that this might be having, and that there's you know, opportunities for um, uh, for them to to look after uh, their their health. And if a, if a young person is just beginning their career in the public sector, um, they might be temporary. Uh, th th these are things that uh, could be uh, contributing. In terms of um, um, uh, uh, younger people um, being in the public service being exposed to a global crisis for the first time. Um, I think us older people have been exposed to, to, to global crises, but, but I don't think anything of this, this type. Um, and, and I think we have um, um, had to share our learning regardless of um, our experience or how grey we are through through experience it, um, and 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 learn and and learn together as we've looked at how our, um, our public sector will respond, um, because in all areas of government uh, there have been fundamental tasks to support the community at this time and changes in the way that we do things. So um, so we've been all been in that uh, that journey. We have 
our our younger staff can can um, can be an insight into to how we respond to the community, um, and and it may be that um, uh, this. This could be a, a formative um, experience in the career of those people in, in the public sector because they, they, they've seen how flexible it is possible to be and how quickly things can be done and, 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 and what successful strategies can look like in a, in a short time frame. Um, so, so the lessons of COVID could be there for 30 or 40 years in the way um, people serve uh, our community. I have I have a sense of responsibility with the experience that I have to, you know, um, take you know a, a, in terms of leadership is to take them with us on that journey, yes. learn from them, but also our job is to make sure that we we help them manoeuvre, um, you know, the, the the things that they may not be aware of because we have at, at least had a bit of experience, so you've got that behind you. Um, so that Luke, that constant change, um, uh, people are actually. You know, feeling anxious. There's no doubt about it. Um, I'm looking for some advice here. Is it is it possible for us to live anxiety free, or is this it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's possible for us as human beings to live anxiety free. Uh, the 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 autonomic nervous response, or the or the the fight flight response, as it's commonly called, is is a part of our makeup. It, it is part of what uh, part of how we operate in 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 our normal lives, in, in our uh, prehistoric lives, is how we've survived. Um, it, it's, it's more about how we define those terms, I think. There's misunderstanding around the word anxiety and what it actually means, and some confusion perhaps between anxiety and stress. There's a certain amount of stress is actually quite positive. Um, you think about uh, assignments that you had to do, uh, or, or meetings or presentations that you have to do, a certain amount of adrenaline is actually quite good in order to help us to become motivated and focused and uh, our attention and uh, our thinking and, uh, and our presentation style, that, that is actually quite positive. It's when those levels reach such a high level and perhaps over a long period of time that it starts to become detrimental. Or anxiety is where uh, a fear of a situation impedes us from doing what we need to do. That's where it becomes problematic. So I think it's not possible to live anxiety free. It's normal to experience anxiety. If you have strategies in place and people around you to manage uh, situational anxiety that occurs every now and then, then we're probably not talking too much damage. But in these times, we need to watch that stress is positive and motivating, but anxiety, if it is occurring and impeding us from doing what we need to do, and it's happening over a prolonged period, that we know that in ourselves and that we seek assistance to be able to help us to gain new insights, new strategies, to manage those levels of anxiety, to bring them back down to a manageable level. Great, okay. Well, I'm on to the final two questions here. Um, so, John, moving on from the anxiety, we're feeling overwhelmed, um, then we anxiety, and then maybe it, it, you know, you haven't dealt with it, and depression uh, may actually um, kick in. Um, what would, what would be the advice, I guess, if people feel that now it is out of control, and now I, I, I feel down, and you know, I'm now self-diagnosing, or I feel like I'm heading into um, moods or depression. Um, how am I going to get myself out of this? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. I think um, um, recognition is, um, is is very important, and um, and and I think for um, uh, people to be aware of the sorts of symptoms that can occur, the anxiety symptoms, um, anger, irritability, sometimes physical symptoms that don't have another cause like persistent headaches or nausea can be part of this. And, mm -hmm. and then we've talked about sleep and energy, concentration, all of, all of these um, types of um, symptoms. Um, some people can pick it up on, in themselves. Others will depend on those around them to say, you're not quite your usual uh, self. And, and then it's overcoming once recognising that, that a person might need help, and there's, you know, that we, we, we have so many ways of knowing to, to, to help people through, through evidence-based um, therapies and um, counselling that, 
that, that people really do need to, get to reach out and get help. I and, say, and, and not be embarrassed to do so. And not well. be embarrassed to do so. And this, this gets back to that, that issue that uh, uh, Luke talked about, the, the, the stigma, because people might recognise that they need to, but still be inhibited about, um, uh, about talking about this with their GP, getting, getting a referral, seeing a, a mental health professional. Um, if, if being uncertain about what to do, um, uh, getting on, on the website, the Beyond Blue website, calling numbers to, yeah. to talk through, uh, through options. And we'll provide some of those, I think, yes. at the end of yeah. this as well. I'm going to end with a final question to both of you. I'd like to end it on a positive note because I think it is positive that we're talking about this. Um, we've certainly signed the South Australian Health and Wellbeing Charter on behalf of the public sector, so being public about mental health and wellbeing is important. How important is hope um, for our mental health? Um, and is this something we can produce for ourselves? So let's leave it on a note, a comment from each of you about what hope, what that means and what role that can play for us. I think hope can be captured within optimism. So optimism is having that cognitive ability in the face of adversity and uncertainty to still maintain an aspect of positive future outcomes. That's what optimism is. Having that ability, despite all the evidence around being negative, all of the pressures, all of the stressors, to still somehow be able to find a way cognitively to say to yourself, okay, all this is going on, it's all very overwhelming, it all seems very negative, but I'm still looking forward to these events. I'm still planning something that's gonna happen in the future. And I believe that this will get better. I don't know how, but I believe it will get better. And I know that I have the supports around me. I know I have internal resilience and strength that no matter what happens, I will be able to cope with whatever comes in the future. Thank you. John. I think Luke has summarised the importance of hope um, uh, uh, very well. And uh, uh, I think clinically people can, can lose hope uh, at, at an emotional level. They might feel that things are hopeless, but just being reminded of the, the sort of factual, the cognitive side of things, that there, there is reason to be hope, there's in, to have hope, there's information about um, uh, people's recovery, if they are experiencing mental health sy symptoms, people will get there. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and, and then for all of us, um, um, the, um, uh, the hope that uh, the collective situation will, will change. Um, we can think back to, to what it was like in March uh, this, this year. Um, it, it was a very uncertain time and, um, and, and, and so far it has been working out um, uh, thanks to, to the way we as a community have, uh, have responded. And, um, and I, I think um, uh, as we're going into into 2021, um, there is still uncertainty, but there's 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 re reason to be hopeful, and there are things that um, are within our control um, as a community, but also as individuals and and wow. steps we can take. Well, thank you so much, thank John you. Bradley. Thank you, Luke Broomhall. I think we have a lot to be hopeful for here in South Australia, and I thank you for the contribution that you both made. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.